Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Terrace. I'm a consultant in paediatric intensive care and paediatric anaesthesia in the Children's Hospital here in Belfast. I'm also the clinical lead for paediatric transport with the NYSTAR team. The plan today had been to have a look at an interactive case of an infant with problematic bronchiolitis, but sadly that has not proven to be possible. So I thought instead I would spend a bit of time just looking at bronchiolitis more generally and the um, workload that it brings to us all. So bronchiolitis, we all know and understand, uh, first described in the BMJ in 1941 by a paediatrician and a pathologist, Hubble and Osborne, who described it as, uh, for the first time as a separate uh, disease in its own right. Previously, it been considered to be a bronchopneumonic process. It's the most common cause of hospitalisation in infants in the first year of life. Uh, it's estimated there's about 450,000 GP episodes annually in the UK and about 30,000 admissions every bronch season, with about 2 to 6% of those admitted children requiring critical care. Healthcare costs for RSV alone are estimated to be somewhere between 50 and £57 million pounds per year. And although a disease of low morbidity, it's not zero, uh, and in the UK it's estimated to be about 80 deaths per season. Pathophysiology of bronchiolitis is fairly familiar to us all. It's most commonly seen in previously healthy children, but there is an increasing risk of severe disease in children with congenital heart disease, those with airway abnormalities, those born prematurely, or children with trisomy 21. Environmental smoke exposure, both antenatally and postnatally, or air pollution may also increase the risk of severe disease. What happens? Well, child is exposed to a respiratory virus, which leads to the initial upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, uh, nasal discharge, fever, uh, poor form, poor feeding. A failure of the immune system to clear the virus uh, results in spread from the upper airways to the lower airways in approximately one third of children. And this can either be by direct spread, uh, essentially inhaled snot, uh, or by viral spread through the body. The resulting mucus and airway edema uh, causes airway obstruction, and this is a mixture of complete obstruction leading to atelectasis uh, and dynamic obstruction causing wheeze, hyperinflation and increased work of breathing. Resolution of the uh, symptoms occurs over the following 10 to 14 days uh, as the uh, virus is brought under control. The causative viruses will be familiar to us all. Um, the key feature seen is the seasonality of viruses with the viruses peaking during the colder winter months. This slide shows data from uh, England and Wales from 2010 to 2020, showing the seasonal peaks in virus uh, presentation uh, with last respiratory virus uh, season uh, having a fairly hefty RSV peak. RSV is the most common uh, causative agent identified in bronchiolitis, and infection is nearly ubiquitous by age two. Other causes of bronchiolitis include adenovirus, influenza, parainfluenza, rhinovirus, metanumavirus, and of course, coronavirus. So briefly, I have to mention the elephant in the room, which is the COVID-19 pandemic and the SARS-CoV-2 that we're seeing. Children uh, are minimally affected or appear minimally affected with the novel coronavirus disease, but uh, those who are presenting appear to be broadly in one of two groups, so either uh, the PIMS-TS post-inflammatory type presentation or presenting with non-specific viral upper respiratory tract infection symptoms that are going to make it very hard to delineate between your standard bronch and your COVID-19 bronch. Importantly, 85% of pre-pandemic coronavirus bronchiolitis patients uh, had an identified co-infecting virus, and 10 to 51% of children with SARS-CoV-2 uh, also have other respiratory viruses identified. So isolating uh, one virus doesn't rule out the presence of a second virus and all appropriate precautions need to be taken. Identifying positive cases is vital to allow appropriate isolation and protection of others, including staff, but similarly important to be able to de-escalate PPE and free up isolation space to allow healthcare systems to flow. Uh, capacity is limited and will quickly become overwhelmed if everybody needs to be treated in full PPE.
the recent national guidance from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health on the management of children with bronchiolitis and lower respiratory tract infections during COVID-19 uh, is an attempt in part to uh, alleviate the pressure on systems and try and prevent this from happening. Positive effects of the pandemic potentially. Uh, this is data from a South American group looking at four countries following their uh, most recent uh, winter season. The solid bars show the average daily temperature, so the, the dip uh, kind of May, June, July, August, uh, equating to their winter period when they would classically see their bronchiolitis peak. The uh, blue line shows the figures from 2018 for low respiratory tract infection admissions, the yellow line, uh, the 2019 data, and then the pale grey line at the bottom, the 2020 data which I think you can see shows a significant reduction, an 83% reduction in lower respiratory tract infection admissions to PICU uh, during this last season, a 92% reduction in RSV and a 78% reduction in flu admissions. This suggests that the social measures that have been taken, so increasing hand washing, social distancing, more use of face masks, for example, is having a significant impact on our standard bronchiolitis uh, and may help alleviate some of the pressures uh, that we are otherwise facing. So treatment for bronchiolitis, well, I think this is excellent advice from Hobbs to Calvin um, and has been the mainstay of my treatment in ICU for many years. Um, I think it's important to, to recognise that often what we do comes with uh, problems and that sometimes doing nothing is actually the, the best that we can manage. Main areas to focus on, I suppose, so uh, hydration, uh, important to assess for dehydration and manage uh, where present, uh, ideally enterally if at all possible. If you are going to use IV fluids, uh, you need to be careful to avoid hyponatremia. Uh, 2003, a group from Evelina Intensive Care uh, looked at their bronchiolitis patients and identified hyponatremia in 33% of all their RSV positive broncs uh, requiring critical care admission. 11% of those had a sodium below 130 millimoles per litre. So it's common uh, and can be significant uh, and may require treatment. Hypoxemia, so what is hypoxic with bronchiolitis? Uh, current NICE guidance recommends targeting saturations over 92%, whilst the World Health Authority and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend targeting saturations of greater than 90%. Some have suggested that routine pulse oximetry has led to overtreatment and is partly responsible for the rising admission rates that we see and have seen with bronchiolitis year on year. This paper is an interesting review of uh, several different uh, papers that have attempted to answer the question of where the correct level of uh, saturation targeting should be set. Included in this is the 2015 uh, BID study, so the oxygen saturation targets in infants with bronchiolitis. And essentially this group uh, targeted either 90% or 94% uh, in patients. Um, the control group um, had standard oxygen saturation monitors on, whereas the treatment group had uh, oxygen saturation probes that were adjusted to only show correct saturations below 90%, um, and anything between 90 and 94% was adjusted to show a figure that was greater than 94%. Their primary uh, outcome in the study was resolution of cough, which I, I consider to be a slightly strange outcome, uh, if I'm honest, but was found to be not different between the groups. However, there were no adverse incidents noted between the two groups. Longer term neurodevelopmental outcomes were not assessed um, on the assumption that short periods of uh, saturations uh, at or below 90, uh, around 90% rather, uh, were not uh, going to have a significant impact. Bottom line, I think, uh, for us, we need to target numbers that are expected by our local and national guidance. This is what we will be judged against. Um, certainly in Northern Ireland, the bronchiolitis guidance that we have in the Children's Hospital uh, targets saturations of 92% and above. But uh, I would recommend having a, a read of this paper because I think it does raise some interesting questions about where the um, kind of over medicalisation of care uh, has impacts and may have negative impacts on children's care. Other interventions uh, that have been tried um, are many and myriad, um, and none have been shown to um, offer benefit, and some may actually come with harm. 
Uh, so the use of nebulized medications, um, salbutamol, ipratropium, steroids, uh, hypertonic saline, and none have been shown to have a significant benefit uh, to patients and none are routinely recommended. Similarly, the use of caffeine um, and the use of caffeine for apnea um, has not been shown to uh, have a significant uh, impact um, and is not routinely recommended. Nasal suction, well, it may help with feeding, um, but care needs to be taken that it's not too deep. You don't want to cause trauma in the nose um, and worsen the situation. But if it's required just to, to clear the nares to allow the, the child to feed, uh, then it may be worth doing. Antibiotics are not routinely indicated uh, unless uh, the patient's requiring critical care or escalation of care, um, where about 30% of uh, children will have a, a co-infection and a bacterial superinfection. Um, but where antibiotics are started, certainly our policy in intensive care is to de-escalate them as quickly as possible um, and to uh, stop within 48 hours, ideally, um, depending on results from um, bronchial alveolar lavage. So who do you escalate? Uh, when do you escalate and how do you escalate, I suppose, are, are important questions. When to escalate? Well, escalation is required for patients who are objectively failing uh, standard supportive treatment. So patients who have been managed on the ward uh, with uh, oxygen therapy were indicated, um, but are not uh, responding. 2015 NICE guidance suggests that uh, signs of failure um, are essentially impending respiratory failure and that escalation should be considered if showing signs of exhaustion, such as listlessness or decreased respiratory effort. Recurrent apnea um, or the inability to maintain target oxygen saturations despite uh, appropriate oxygen supplementation and kind of maximal oxygen supplementation at ward level. Important to stress that worker breathing alone is not an indication for escalation. It's not an uncommon phone call for us to receive in intensive care uh, to say that the, the child uh, may tire. Um, and whilst that is a child who, who bears close watch and um, may require further intervention, um, it's not an indication to escalate care uh, on the basis that they uh, may tire. How to escalate then? Uh, so I think that the standard pathway that we're all familiar with through high flow um, consideration of CPAP and then on to invasive ventilation. A lot of debate and discussion about um, high flow and its role uh, for bronchiolitis. Um, it's increasingly used in a variety of areas, but the evidence to support its routine use is currently lacking. Um, it appears to have a role in patients who have failed standard treatment, um, but doesn't alter the course of patients uh, if started early. It may have a role in supporting patients following extubation uh, to prevent re-intubation, um, but uh, other than that, its uh, role is still not quite clear. CPAP. Uh, more aggressive therapy um, and generally not available at ward level, so would require escalation to critical care. Um, it has been suggested that uh, it has a, a place in bronchiolitis. The 2017 Tramontane study, which compared nasal CPAP to high flow bronchiolitis, um, the results of this did not show inferiority of high flow, but did suggest a higher relative risk of success with CPAP. However, as mentioned, CPAP may not be uh, routinely available um, and given access to critical care, uh, this option may be limited locally depending where you work. Currently, the first ABC trial is uh, underway um, to try and establish the non-inferiority of high flow compared to CPAP in critically ill children, both in terms of step up and step down care. Um, and this trial is underway in the UK uh, as a, a multi-centre trial. So children that fail, children who require invasive ventilation, well, um, my approach to things as you've gathered already is fairly simplistic. Um, and I uh, like to, to consider things in, a, in a, a fairly broad fashion. We're all familiar with the DOPES mnemonic uh, that uh, is used to identify issues. And I think it's a useful framework to hang our thoughts around um, ventilation issues that might arise in patients with uh, bronchiolitis who have been intubated and ventilated. So displacement of tubes, um, correct positioning of the tube is important uh, to avoid the tube being dislodged and falling out or to prevent endobronchial placement. The tolerances and distances that you're talking about are one to two centimetres in some of our smaller patients. So it's not uncommon for the ET tube tip to lie too low. Uh, 
That coupled with uh, oral intubation and the difficulties of securing an oral tube uh, in a, an exact position uh, result in uh, potential problems. So always consider tube placement if the patient is not behaving as you would expect um, at any stage. So uh, tubes will frequently sl slip in through the tape, um, having been previously x-rayed and been shown to be in a, in a decent position. Obstruction or partial obstruction is a common cause of difficulties with ventilation. And pathophysiologically, pathophysiolo uh, you think about this as a disease of mucus production, um, which can obstruct not only the airways, but also the, the ET tube. And suctioning the ET tube can make a huge difference uh, in your airway pressures and your uh, ventilation, um, and is always worth considering. Pneumothorax is rare, but can happen, um, and uh, when it happens, needs appropriate and urgent management. Equipment may malfunction, but often the equipment is functioning perfectly well. It's just functioning well for an adult patient, but not coping with your standard small bronch baby. Adult circuits and excess dead space uh, can result in virtually no tidal volume being delivered to the patient. So always make sure that the patient is ventilating, uh, that their chest is rising and falling. Um, and I wouldn't rely too much on the, the numbers that the ventilator is uh, generating. So targeting tidal volume is appropriate, um, but uh, restricting tidal volume uh, at the expense of chest movement uh, is detrimental to the patient. Initially, after intubation, these patients may require recruitment to open up the lungs, uh, followed by adequate PEEP to maintain lung volume. And the same goes following any episode of disconnection or suction where the patient may de-recruit. It's important to, to ensure that you have maximised and recruited uh, the lung back where possible. You can see breath stacking in bronchiolitis as a result of the dynamic airway obstruction. Um, so it's important to ensure that there's adequate expiratory time uh, uh, available to the patient to allow full exhalation. And this can be achieved best by reducing the rate um, and watching the IE ratio. If the ventilator you're using has it, uh, looking at the flow time loop to check that the flow actually gets to zero before the next breath is delivered is a, another useful way to assess whether you're at risk of breath stacking. Roughly, so suggested initial settings for a ventilator, well, a respiratory rate of around 30, an eye time of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, something like that, um, and then enough peak pressure uh, to see adequate chest movement, ideally limiting that to below 30 centimetres of water at peak. The targets, um, so I think we're all guilty on uh, occasion of uh, overachieving on our targets in these patients. So we have to remember that uh, mechanical ventilation is not physiological normal ventilation. So we shouldn't be aiming for normal uh, targets either. So target saturations, maintaining them greater than 92% and weaning your oxygen where able uh, and carbon dioxide levels, well, anything up to 10 kilopascals, uh, assuming the pH is well compensated and above 7.25. But um, as I often uh, bang on to the trainees in ICU, um, target figures uh, or accepting figures rather with a pH of 7.4 and a CO2 of 5 um, suggests that you're working the lungs too hard um, and that comes with the, the risk of, of longer term lung damage. What else do we want as a retrieval team when we arrive to collect this patient? So an appropriate ET tube in the correct position as discussed already. Um, do be careful, um, the uh, correctly has been a move towards using cuffed tubes, um, but we are still seeing uh, errors with the wrong size of tube being used. So um, micro cuffs, um, I think are the most commonly used tubes um, and they do have suggested age ranges uh, and weight ranges for, uh, for the smaller patients. So don't size using any other uh, equations that you're, you're used to using. An NG or an OG tube to decompress the stomach is important. Um, uh, children, as you know, uh, tolerate um, gastric insufflation poorly, um, pushes up on the diaphragm, reduces your compliance and will make your ventilation much more difficult. So um, putting in a, a tube and actually decompress the, decompressing the stomach is important. Um, IV access, so peripheral IV access is perfectly appropriate. Um, ideally, two points of access to uh, allow for a failure uh, during transfer. Um, and the ability to um, continue the journey without having to, to stop to, to achieve second access.
arterial arterial access rather is not uh, important for your standard bronch. So I think a a bronchiolytic patient who's ventilating easily um, and is not requiring excessive pressure or excessive oxygen um, can be managed without an arterial line, and that removes the risk then um, of thrombosis, uh, etc. That you, that you can see with arterial lines, particularly in this uh, kind of weight range of patients. Suitable sedation and paralysis. Um, this uh, will vary from where you work. Uh, generally, uh, morphine for the for the younger patients uh, under a month uh, alone, um, plus or minus midazolam for those older patients. Again, not uncommon to see uh, patients maintained on volatile anaesthetics. Uh, so the use of, of sevoflurane, which is um, acceptable for standard anaesthetic practice, but less acceptable for the critically unwell patients or bronchiolytic who's required intubation and ventilation. Um, they'll tolerate it poorly. Their uh, blood pressure will uh, likely drop um, and that will just drive a, a vicious cycle of more fluid boluses to, to maintain it. So um, try and get rid of the volatile as quickly as possible and get them settled and established onto IV sedation. Interestingly, in the 1940s, it was standard to use brandy, whiskey or port to sedate infants with uh, bronchiolitis, but we wouldn't recommend that uh, anymore. But you uh, uh, can uh, have a small whiskey yourself after a stressful uh, bronchiolitis stabilisation in theatre. Chest x-ray um, to confirm tube placement and to, to have a look at the lungs is, is useful um, and most transport teams would want to see a chest x-ray before they move that patient um, to make sure that the, um, the plastic is all in the right place. What does the future hold for uh, bronchiolitis? Um, where are the areas of research? Well, uh, currently the BEST trial is uh, ongoing. Um, this is a multi-center RCT, which is comparing surfactant to uh, placebo, essentially air down the ET tube. Um, in children who are ventilated with bronchiolitis. And they're looking to see uh, a significant uh, effect on reduction in mechanical ventilation um, by 18 hours, which is their primary endpoint. This uh, is currently in its third season um, and uh, recruitment is ongoing. So um, we'll see, uh, be interested to see rather the, the results that come out of this and whether it answers the question finally as to what role uh, surfactant plays in children with bronchiolitis. Um, who end up ventilated. This is another interesting trial, something I hadn't heard about but came across um, in preparation for this talk. So nitric oxide um, that we will use in intensive care um, for oxygenation and, and improving VQ mismatch, um, but it also has a, a, an antiviral property um, and there's been some suggestions that it may be of benefit to children with viral uh, pneumonitic processes, um, including bronchiolitis. So this group in Israel, and uh, this is a, a, an early kind of multi-center RCT, uh, where they used intermittent high-dose nitric uh, oxide inhaled administration five times a day for up to five days. High dose uh, is not an understatement. They're using 160 parts per million uh, in these patients when classically we used 20, maybe 40 parts per million in intensive care. Very small numbers in, in each arm, but they did suggest a, a significant reduction in length of stay uh, improved oxygenation um, and uh, no safety issues identified um, in either arm. So importantly, the rates of methemoglobinemia were not um, too significant as to, to stop treatment. So um, watch the space. Uh, they are planning a larger trial to see. That's everything from me. I'd uh, like to thank you uh, for your, your time. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we uh, hopefully will be able to get to them. Many thanks.